Hello, this is Gabriel Barahona, and today I'm working with Lindsay Collins on assignment 8 for ENGI 450. And today we're going to talk about how to use methods analysis. So first of all, methods analysis. What is methods analysis? Methods analysis is determining the precise procedure for performing a job or a task. It's sort of similar with task analysis, but in a bigger frame. And what is the starting point? Where do you start? You start at the standard method. The standard method is the initial standard which has been used in the past and is most likely being used in the manufacturing environment where you are trying to implement methods analysis. And it's based studying other alternatives that equally meet or surpass the standard method can tend to replace the standard method. And this is what methods analysis is all about. The three methods analysis that we're going to talk about today are charting, workspace design, and finally we'll talk about motion economy. The first charting was used as a visual mapping of operations. It was developed by Frank and Lillian Gilbreth, uh, who are known to be the founders of industrial engineering, as they worked on methods um, analysis through charting. And the image here is a uh, display of an operations process chart where, where you divide into different elements, such as we see there, install tong jack, fast and decking. These are different elements that all represent an overall cycle of assembling a utility trailer. Beside an operations process chart, there are also other charting techniques, such as a flow process chart, a multiple activities chart, and a PERT chart. For example, let's take into account a PERT chart. PERT chart are program evaluation and review technique charts. And you label the arcs with task durations. And the task must be decomposed into functional areas. So similar to a PERT chart, which can be used in management as well, the different other operation charts divide the task into smaller elements in order to better visualize the overall process. And when do you use charting? Well, you use charting when there is a defined process that can be divided into steps, as I had mentioned. And why do you use it? It provides expli an explicit mapping of operations and times. And you can have a clear understanding of the process and perform a proper task analysis. The second method we're going to speak of is workstation design. And basically, this is improving the worksite environment through an ergonomic design. And just some of the major principles in workstation design, you want to make the workstation adjustable to the 95th percentile. That means that you want the, both the tallest person and the shorter person to be able to feel comfortable in your workstation. And there are measurements for this, and you can take a look at the anthropometric chart and look at all the dimensions needed. This is to avoid process and have everything close so that the overall production can go as quickly as possible. You also want to avoid static loads and fixed postures and this is uh, specifically related to avoid CTD injuries in your, um, in your employees and manufacturing workers. You also want to provide easy to read displays and this has a lot to do with industrial hygiene and the importance of having warning signs for any hazards in the worksite environment. And one last important one, you want to eliminate any undesirable environmental conditions such as noise, extreme temperatures, and poor illumination, since this could have a heavy impact on your production. When do you use workstation design? Where in methods improvement, you should use workstation design whenever you're dealing with worksite analysis. And why should you use it? Well, it's an optimal method, very highly ergonomic. Uh, the workstation design is directly linked with safety, and this is always a major concern. And productivity, productivity is highly dependent on the working environment. We're going to talk about the principles of motion economy, and this is another section of methods analysis. So when should you use motion economy? Uh, there's three main reasons why you would use this. First, uh, when you're at in any environment determining what hand slash body movements um, are, are appropriate for a certain worker, uh, depending on what tasks. It's also important when determining appropriate work physiology 
and also when dealing with the use of hand and tool equipment uh, and the motions that go along with using these uh, tools and equipment. So there's also a couple reasons why we would want to use motion economy in general. Motion economy uh, is used to save money by making motions more efficient uh, and it also saves time which um, in turn saves money for the company. Also uh, we want to note that this doesn't necessarily guarantee optimal performance but it's guideline for improving performance and motion in general. So the way that um, motion economy is performed is through um, the implementation of a list of principles and we're going to go through the 16 principles uh, briefly of each of the um, motion economy. Um, so the first one is two hands should begin and complete their motions at the same time. And this is talking about um, the topic of counterbalance and how the hands need to have the same amount of tasks going on at the same time to be efficient. The second um, principle is that two hands should not be ideal at the same time. Uh, a good example of this is typing on the computer. Obviously your right hand doesn't do all the work or have a majority of the important letters, but the keyboard is set up so that both hands are have an equal amount of work to do and letters to type. The third and fourth principles go along with postural freedom. And the third is a person should be able to maintain an upright position during work. And also work activities should permit the operator to adapt a variety of healthy postures. So this, um, both of these are talking about how at work a person should be able to move around and adjust their posture to reduce strain on certain muscles and ligaments and joints. And this can in turn reduce uh, CTDs and various other injuries. The fifth principle, like the first principle we talked about, and it says that the motions of the arm should be made in opposite and symmetrical directions simultaneously. The sixth, uh, seventh, and eighth principle all go along with Newton's law of physics. So the first one is hand and body motions should be assigned to the lowest classification that can properly perform a task. So an example of this would be that if there's a button to be pushed on a machine, a worker wouldn't use their whole palm to push the button, but instead would use just the tip of their finger. The seventh principle is momentum should be used to assist whenever possible. And then the last one that has to do with Newton's law of physics is that smooth continuous motions of the arm are preferred. And this is uh, talking about the principle that says a body in motion tends to stay in motion. So if the arms are continuously moving in a generic motion that they're going to tend to um, work e more easily than making sharp sudden movements. The ninth and tenth principle are that the work activities should be performed with the joints at about midpoint on their range of movement, and then the largest appropriate muscle group should be used when force is exerted. And the last set of principles that we're going to talk about, uh, the eleventh, is that work should not be performed consistently at or above the level of the heart. So this is obvious um, that someone shouldn't be overworking themselves. And then 12 is rest pauses should reflect all the demands experienced in work. And this goes along with Merle's approximation. So 13, ballistic movements are obviously easier, faster, and typically more accurate. If an unbalanced force acts on the body, the body will accelerate, which is obvious um, physics. The 15th principle is that work should be arranged to permit a uniform and natural rhythm. And the principle behind this is that most are all people have a certain rhythm and gait that they perform at. So it's easier to have people perform at their own rhythm than try to adapt people to a specific rhythm for a task. And then the final principle is that required eye fixations should be few and close together. And this has to do with the topic of hand-eye coordination. And it basically says that the hands and the eyes kind of follow each other. So the less fatigue that the eyes experience, then in turn the hand will experience less fatigue as well. So an example of how you could perform motion economy goes back to the example of Merle's approximation. So the um, example we're going to look at here is that a specific employee is doing 3,800 kilocalories. That's how much um, calories they're burning per shift. And they work for eight hours. So obviously eight hours is 480 minutes that they're working. And they're allowed 15% of their time is um, breaks, which is 72 minutes. So you divide the overall kilocalories divided by the time they're working. So we determine that 9.3 kilocalories are burned per minute by this employee. So then we can use Merle's approximation formula 
to determine that 225 minutes of rest time is required for this specific um, job that this employee is doing. We subtract the 72 minutes that was already allotted earlier, and we determine that 153 minutes of additional rest time, other than the rest time that's already given, is needed for this employee. So that's an example of how to perform motion economy. And this uh, concludes our presentation. Here are, here's a look at a few of our sources. Uh, thank you for watching.